uh, there's a rock in Saratoga Springs uh, upon which uh, the following prayer is etched uh, by an Indian dude in the 1700s, a guy named Tom White Cloud. And here's what White Cloud says, and apparently this represents the feelings of the Indians uh, in my area uh, of a few hundred years ago. So here's uh, White Cloud saying, Oh, Father, whose voice I hear in the woods and whose breath gives life to all the world, hear me. I am a man before you, one of your many children. I am small and weak. I need your strength and wisdom. Let me walk in beauty and make my eyes ever behold the red and purple sunset. Make my hands respect the things you have made, my ears sharp to hear your voice. I seek strength, Father, not to be superior to my brothers, but to be able to fight my greatest enemy, myself. Make me ever ready to come to you with clear hands and straight eye, so that when life fades as the fading sunset, my spirit may come to you without shame. All right, note the contrast between that and Burl Ives saying, if I could buy enough shit, maybe I can live forever. And, and note, uh, that I think we've got to a lot to learn uh, from other cultures about life in general uh, and about death, both in life and, and after life. And of course, any anthropologist is going to have to endorse that claim somewhat heartily. Let me turn around, though, and say that I think our culture has quite a bit to offer. If most of this lecture seemed uh, like a convenient opportunity to bash uh, American culture, it's because it was, uh, and I think we deserve it, uh, but that's not to suggest that there aren't aspects about popular American culture uh, that are not potentially invaluable. I think we have as much to offer to the world around us as we have to gain uh, by paying attention to folks in other times and places. Uh, and for Becker, uh, that's really where he was at at the end of his life. He said that we all have a responsibility as social scientists and as human beings uh, to collectively construct ever increasingly useful uh, visions about the nature of reality. In other words, we're supposed to be myth makers. Uh, unlike uh, a lot of scientists who uh, say, well, I want to find the truth, Becker said, yeah, that's important. Uh, but equally important is the continuous development uh, of increasingly constructive ways of thinking about ourselves and the world around us. And I think that's a good idea, Ned. It's something that we should try. L let me shut up because I've taken too much time. Thank you for your uh, unbelievably kind attention. Uh, and just open things up for questions or comments. Anybody? <laughs> Go ahead. good questions globbed into one. And did everyone hear that or should I amplify? The, the question was, is it really the case that every one of us comes to a genuine emotional recognition vis-a-vis -vis the awareness of death and possibly suffers the psychological consequences thereof? And the answer to that is no. That, that in fact, uh, according to Becker, the world as we know it, for better or worse, is predicated on most people not ever doing that. And the claim is, is that that's what culture is designed to prevent, it is the confrontation with your mortality that you encountered. Having said that, though, that's not to suggest that that's the way it ought to be. Right? Depressed people are not the ones committing mass genocide. Those are happy people masquerading under the banner uh, of nationalism. And so uh, th there is a severe price to be paid 
for not coming to terms with our mortality. And that's easy for me to say from a distance. But I remember my moment, and I've talked about this in front of the Becker Foundation before I read these books. And I was a 25-year-old college professor. And I'm like, I can't teach anymore. I, I quit my job for a year and worked in a restaurant. So I, my moment came then. I, and you know, 15 years later, look at me. It still hasn't worked out. But um, I haven't killed anybody uh, either. And so I, I don't mean to make light of your questions. They're, they're very poignant ones. And one of the things that we've talked about in the context of the Becker Foundation is this idea that perhaps the human race cannot move in the evolutionary sense uh, until we all grow up, as it were, and come to terms constructively uh, with our own mortality, be it through religious or psychotherapeutic or some sort of social intervention. Yeah, nice question, though. Uh, uh, other things, I know we're not uh, long on time, but I'm, I'm not in a rush. Uh, other questions, anybody? I should point out also uh, that my buddies and I have done, at this point, over a hundred experiments, most of them published in psychology journals, uh, where we have tried to determine whether or not all of this stuff is true, whatever that means. And that anybody that's interested, uh, I'll make sure Jim knows how to find me. Uh, or do you, are you on email? Anybody do the email thing? Let me give you my email address, because if you like this stuff, Write to me and say hi anyway. If you're in New York, come by, out of town, call, collect. Uh, if, if what I do, for the most part, as Neil told you, uh, I use every opportunity that I can to shamelessly cavort around and, and talk about Becker's ideas. I think they are important. I, I think he's one of the most uh, least recognized profound thinkers of this century. And it's nice to hear that this is provocative. But none of that is me. Uh, what my buddies and I, we're experimental social psychologists. Uh, we do these studies that I think are very clever, quite frankly, uh, where uh, we basically ask people in a subtle laboratory paradigm to think about themselves dying. And then, uh, like 15 minutes later, we have them do some other stuff where we look at what happens to you as a person after you've been asked to think about the fact that you're going to die. And to make a long story short, and this may not make sense to a lot of you, what we find is that after thinking about your own death, you love anybody from your culture more, and you hate people that are different more than you did before. And I would argue that that's a point very much in favor of this conceptual analysis. There's a lot more to it than that. But please do, especially psychology types, if you're empirically inclined, uh, note that we have now 15 years of empirical studies in support of all of the primary claims that I've made on behalf of Becker today. Other things? Well, you see, that, that's a good question. And of course, obviously, uh, for Becker, this is an unattainable ideal. We are, after all, human. And this, he just wants to set a standard for us to work towards. Uh, if he were here to represent himself, I, I suspect he would offer us some of the perhaps Scandinavian countries' mixed models as moving in the right direction. And, and also note that Becker was brutal with regard to his condemnation of what goes on here, while at the same time being equally forceful with regard to Americans being in a real good position to do something about it. Because Americans, we think we can do anything, right? That's part of the thing that makes Americans endearing, is that we're like, yeah, we're fucking Americans. We can do everything. <laughs> and in fact, if we took that seriously, uh, we, we ought to be at the vanguard uh, of the development of a good culture. The, but again, good question. Uh, I think that we have to see this as an unattainable abstraction. Just like for Becker, mental health is an ideal to be approximated, uh, but never acquired. Anybody think you're there already? If you are for him, uh, get ye to the clinic. All right, uh, other stuff. <laughs> <laughs>